Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Hannah Wheater. Uh, I'm the social media and digital marketing executive from Right Child Toolkit, and I'd just like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, Right Child Toolkit uh, HR software, a uh, price HR software for SMEs, um, and we run a range of ongoing programs um, and webinars covering a variety of HR and business topics. Um, and today we are looking at how to attract candidates uh, to your small business. And our guest speaker is Adrian uh, McDonough, and he will touch on today how to attract talent, um, what HireFull's data shows you um, about how the best ways are to recruit, what candidates want for a potential employer, how to leverage um, how to leverage the key advantages that an SME has over a global brand like Google. And following the presentation today, which should last around 30 minutes, uh, we'll have time to answer some of your questions in the Q&A. So just to point out the Q&A box um, on the top, if you give your mouse a little wiggle, you should be able to see that Q&A box at the top of your uh, Zoom um, page. So feel free to add questions in there as we go. Um, and yeah, if you do have any questions, make sure to put it in there. And if you do have anything in the chat to put, uh, please do get involved as we go, but please do ask your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and just a note, today's session is just offering general advice, not legal. And if you are interested in our range of webinars, our next webinar um, will be looking at long-term long -term absences, how to manage long COVID um, uh, for employees. So I'll add the registration link in the chat following. Um, and firstly, just to introduce um, Adrian to our webinar today, Adrian has run 127 webinars in the past year, which I was uh, amazed at, and he has over two, 22 years working in recruitment and is now the co-founder of Hireful. Um, so Adrian, I'll take it over to you, and once you're ready, feel free to start the presentation. Hi Hannah, thank you for uh, the lovely presentation. Yeah, I'm not used to people... Uh talking about me that's great um I, I, I should be let me just check am I showing my screen yet I'm not am I no, let me just come out of here over to zoom share screen and I need to share a screen too so is that coming through okay Hannah yep I can see that on my end thanks a lot okay great so I've got quite a lot of slides to get through in 30 minutes so I, I will sort of jump in um, as Hannah mentioned, we do lots of webinars here, uh, and what I would start to say is we try and keep our webinars and um, focus very much on the practical, the tactical sort of stuff. So this isn't going to be about bigger strategy ideas. It's going to be about things you can hopefully put to use in the coming days and weeks. So um, the name of the talk, what if you're not Google, attracting talent to your SME, we're not actually going to spend a lot of time looking at Google or Alphabet. Um, but we are going to talk about what are the advantages that the smaller organizations have when it comes to, to making their pitch for candidates um, as opposed to those big, huge multinationals. Because many of you may feel like, oh, you know, you know, we're only so big. And by the way, our company is 53 staff big. So, you know, we're probably similar to a lot of you guys. So uh, and we, we punch a pretty good punch when it comes to recruitment. Um, and um, you'll see some of that through this talk as well. So being small is actually got some great advantages. So you shouldn't be um, dismissive of your potential um, to recruit and attract. And uh, hopefully I'll convince some of you of that as well. So let's um, jump on in. So one of the first things I wanted to start off with was um, the need for an employer brand. And I'm gonna briefly explain about the employer brand and talk about why it's important. But regardless of how you recruit, so for some, um, some of you, you may recruit um, via advertising um, and then obviously candidates, so active candidates who have decided they're already looking for a new position. You know, there's levels of, accuracy, of activeness, but they're somewhat active at the very least, have decided to go and look um, at roles and apply directly to you. And that's quite nice. You can just sift through the CVs and away you go. And that's going to be the easiest way to recruit um, these days, I would have thought, if possible. Um, but maybe you might find that more and more of your adverts are struggling. This market we're in is actually, like I say, Hannah mentioned, 22 years in recruitment, uh, 21 years running my own company, um, and um, never seen a market like it. It's absolutely bonkers in regards to 
the number of vacancies, but also for various reasons, um, no jab, no job. People have been sat at home on furlough and have maybe got new skills. They've had time to think about things and maybe have decided to go in a new direction. They may have been stressed out or, or, or overworked throughout the past 18 months. So for a variety of all these reasons, Brexit, another one, there's more people looking to move jobs than ever before. So um, that in itself is an opportunity, but it's also um, a potential pain point for your business. And um, so you might find your adverts are actually struggling because although we said, yeah, there's lots of candidates out there and they might be being a bit picky and there is definitely a lot of competition out there. Um, so it might be that you have to move on into, um, you know, actually proactively sourcing your own candidates. So going on social networks, the obvious one being LinkedIn, you know, and it might be you really have very hard to find roles um, and you might go and search and say, right, who have we got that's got this experience in our you know, location and reaching out to people on there. We run a whole bunch of webinars showing people how to do that for free if you're interested, quick plug. Um, but regardless of which of these type of methods you're using, you, you're probably going to find and there's a, there's a bias to um, searching online. And by the way, um, so searching the likes of LinkedIn. If you're not searching LinkedIn, but you advertise and then it doesn't work and then you give the rollout to recruitment agencies, they're searching LinkedIn for you. So someone's proactively searching LinkedIn, trying to find those passive candidates and put your opportunity in front of them. And therein lies the problem. Not that recruitment agencies are searching or you're searching. The problem comes with... In the modern world where we live in, if there's a, if my HR toolkit in Sheffield have a vacancy, it's not actually hard for um, that vacancy to get in front of the right people, with the right skills in the Sheffield area. And um, the challenge becomes convincing people that they should apply. Yeah, because it's no longer hard to find someone, let's say, with digital marketing skills, um, like Hannah has, no doubt. It's not no longer hard to find that type of person. You know it's all there you can advertise they can easily find your role you can just find them on linkedin you can approach them the challenge becomes convincing them okay so um some of you may feel that you know this is the impossible challenge at the moment that we're just not getting good people and feel free to you know post on the chat and let us know or post questions and say yeah this is exactly us we are not getting good people and there will be um some reasons for that that we know about we know there's a huge driver shortage in the UK. So there will be some fundamental reasons why organizations are struggling. But actually, um, a lot of it does come down to people finding your role. And when they go to think, research you, they sort of get a different view or they find it a little bit frustrating because they can't find, you know, enough out about your organization. So the question is, you know, take a step back yourself. Think about it. If you were approached, um, with an opportunity to join your business today, whether you're the founder or the owner or HR manager or whatever role you have, think about how candidates get approached. What will they get told? You know, do you email them? Do they see your advert? Think about that advert as well. And you know, the advert can often be a, a quite a big put off. And we run another webinar about teaching you how to write great adverts. So feel free to check out that if that's of interest. Um, but Regardless, once people get the name of your business, once they've had a look at the advert, if they're a, you know, a high talent individual, then they're probably going to want to go and check out and find out a little bit more. Or what happens is they apply first and then you sort of invite them for interview and then you don't hear from them perhaps. And that's because they then just, they applied first to lots of roles. And then when the interviews come back said, OK, let me have a look and see who this organization is and whether it's worth me investing my time. I have got those other three or four interviews now, you know, set up. So it can feel a little bit like mission impossible. Um, and it, I think fundamentally, a lot of it comes down to that decision, you know, and what information you can easily give them. I keep saying easily because, hey, look, this is the internet. Um, I can order a pizza, I can order a taxi, I can book a, a flight uh, abroad in the time it takes the ad breaks to play during you know my favorite um, soap opera perhaps um, and then you know and let's be honest I'm probably not even going to watch the ad breaks I probably will be on social media during that the point being is we all live in this sort of very fast focused world now and everyone feels like you know they're really busy in reality all these are time saving devices we probably have more time than we used to have but that isn't important people feel like they're busy so you've got to make it really easy for them to be able to check you out as an organization 
and really easy for them to find the information they want and, and you make a good impression. And once you're able to do that, you will find you just get good applicants, much better applicants. And it'll be hard to define, you know, which individual thing you're doing necessarily is convincing them, but you'll find it really works. And I say that from my own experience, it really works for us as an organization. Now, but if we have a stop and think about, it, I'm going to show you the top 10 car manufacturers in the UK. Um, and the idea behind this is, um, let's imagine you walk in a dog. I've got a dog. If you haven't got a lot of people got dogs over the lockdown as well. Um, and I enjoy going to walk a dog. And I, I, I live in a little market town uh, and I, I quite often know people there and I might stop and talk to them and how things go in. And someone might say, hey, I've just got a new car. OK, so imagine that conversation. The chances are I'm going to know um, the brand of car they've got. If they said to me, oh, I've just got a new car and it's called a Dakin. And I'm like, hmm, what's a Dakin? By the way, Dakin is the uh, brand of air conditioner we have in the room, I'm saying. <laughs> um, I would, yeah, that would be quite a surprising event. Now, how about, um, so, so when we buy a car, we normally go for a brand we trust, we understand that. So if you're a car manufacturer, having a brand is just vital and it's very hard to establish a new brand and cost a lot of money and cost a lot of effort. Now, think about that same conversation. I'm going to go back to slice, back to the beautiful dogs. Um, you meet someone and they say, hey, I've just got a new job. And you go, oh, great, where are you going to be working? And they say, I'm working at Dakin. And you go, oh, do you immediately go in your head without saying it to them because you're much more polite? That sounds like a terrible idea. Why have you left... Unilever, that company I've heard of, to go work at a company I've never heard of. That sounds ridiculous. We don't think that because we're all very much aware that there are thousands of organizations out there that we've never heard of that are fantastic organizations, probably smaller, but there are, you know, just so many employers out there that are fantastic, possibly ones like Highful or my HR toolkit as well. So we're in that sort of um, eco ecosystem where there's we're not known largely. We might be known in our industry, and that, you know, if we recruit a salesperson from a competitor then that's fine, they'll know of us. But largely, most people don't know us. So it comes down to this moment where you're thinking, will candidates even give you a chance? And the ultimate answer is yes. It comes down to this moment where someone stops and says, okay, what is this opportunity? Could I be interested in this? Is there anything that excites me in this? And it depends on who you're trying to recruit. If mostly what you recruit is, let's imagine it's a big call center and you've got you know, a ready stream of talent there, and there's new students coming into university all the time or something, you know, moving into the area, and you can just add in new active people, active candidates, then that's probably not such a decision that they're going to dwell on as a job seeker. But actually, if you're recruiting sort of harder to find roles, then those individuals are not looking for a job, they're looking for a career, and they're going to think about it a lot more seriously. And this is the moment that will make or break, you know, your, your success of your recruitment program, essentially. And possibly, not trying to put a big deal on it, the, the success of, uh, of your organization, your business as well. So what happens during that period? What do people think about? What information can you give them? So let's um, get stuck into that now and think about what candidates want and how to give it to them. So I've got, starting with a very simple, nice image here. Let me just throw up that as well. So um, this is a survey from LinkedIn where they looked at, you know, a lot of candidates and thought, you know, Tell us about the types of content you want to see. And the number one thing people, candidates want to know, this is the most obvious thing I'm going to say today, they, they want to know what it's really like to work in your organization. Okay, that's a very obvious thing to think about. But then take a step back and think about what would happen if a candidate went to your website now um, and started to check you out. Now, most SMEs, they, you probably don't have a career site. Um, you probably have one page on your website. And most, in my experience, probably has a paragraph or two that was updated over a year ago. Probably not a huge amount of thought went into it necessarily either. Um, and maybe there's a picture of your office. Maybe you can even see inside the office. That would be head of your competition, I would say, in most cases. And possibly still not good enough to attract the talent you want, but it's a starting point. Um, so you need to sort of give people this vision. So... Photos are really key for that. You know, if your website and the information someone can't find out about you, they can't start to see themselves, start to see what's going on. Um, that's a company called Fiverr. I think they're a sort of techie startup company. I can't remember when I took the, the screenshot. Um, but 
I can sort of see that and I can go, well, they've got cool offices. They've got quite an interesting, cool brand. I can read into it. They've probably got a good culture. And you know, I, so I can read that they're probably growing. So I can make a load of inferences from that, which is really key. Now, obviously, I want to back it up as well, which we're going to talk about evidence in a bit. But yeah, that's the sort of thing we want to be sharing. Nice photos. It, we'll talk about video as well. Video is really powerful and some other ideas around that. But we really, you, you need to make an effort. I stress this for SMEs. You really need to make an effort to show people what it's like to work in your organization. If you're sat in an interview with someone or doing a Teams interview or a Zoom interview, and they're saying things like, oh, wow, um, I didn't know you did that. And I, I didn't, you know, I'm so pleased I interviewed you today. I wasn't sure what you did. I wasn't sure you know what your organization was all about but now i've interviewed i'm so excited to work for you you failed because they should be able to get that impression before they interview and maybe not before they apply because people just jump on see a role and can apply in one click sometimes but certainly once you've booked an interview you should be providing them that content they should be sort of becoming aware and starting to get starting to build some excitement starting to build some engagement with those candidates so they actually are, they know that you're a great organization. We share information with um, candidates before they come um, to interview here. And they will say, they'll sit in reception for five minutes and then I'll go meet them. And we'll go across the courtyard to our uh, meeting room to have an, uh, an interview. And they'll say things like, oh, you've got such a great culture and such a great, and I'm thinking, you don't even know my business. You've sat in reception for five minutes. You've inferred all of that from what we've shared with you. And, and guess what? You're right, because there's no point us presenting this picture and it's the wrong picture and um, we've got to present something that's fair and balanced and it's a good representation so i'll carry on <laughs> i love talking to myself because webinars are fun like this um number two thing this will surprise you i think the number two thing that candidates want this comes from a study by the talent board which is a really big study of them um, tens of thousands of candidates um, in europe as, as well as across the world and um, but the number two thing candidates want to know is what is your recruitment process so that's something you might want to consider putting on your website, sharing in the interview emails um, and going through that. We even refer to this in our adverts. So the call to action at the bottom of our adverts, and I mentioned advert copy earlier, will say things like, um, if you, it has a call to action, says like, if you're interested in this opportunity, we would love to, um, to have you apply. And if you do apply, we will feed back to you in three working days. So we're sort of committing ourselves to an SLA already, which is sort of starting to expose them to our uh, recruitment process but also hoping to sort of tell them what's going to happen next so they'll want to go to that next phase so some people particularly if they're not looking might feel that mm, i don't know if i can be recruitment process i think it's very nice to show them the recruitment process so they can feel like actually you know what that doesn't look too bad i feel like i could work with that also it's a great statement because very few organizations share this it shows it doesn't commit you to something it does commit you to something but it doesn't commit you like locked in tight you'll see there step three says task or challenge so this organization has taken a sort of approach to it to sort of give an overview of what they typically do but there'll be times where it probably will change and it does say please note for some roles the process can vary so but it starts to sort of just have a fair and balanced approach with the candidate so you're saying you know i know you're thinking of applying so i think it's only fair that we sort of explain what our process is and, you know, it also shows that you're a fair organization, that you have a process and you treat people fairly. And obviously you don't just hire someone because they look like you or support the same football team. So, yeah, that's another key piece of information um, that people are interested in. That very few people give out. Um, but we also want to talk about um, some other areas. So one of the other areas I've touched on job adverts a little bit. So um, and I think this is one of the advantages that once again the smaller organizations can take um, advantage of and, and that's the ability to use humor i'm using this example from an advert this is from a, a large organization love holidays and um, they're still below a thousand staff they're just a few hundred staff so they're not an sme necessarily or maybe they're sort of a large sme uh, possibly but they use humor in their adverts so um this is the, they've got a, the ability when you see a vacancy they can put a big image at the top of it and they think about that image and they try and use something that engages so I'm not saying you have to do this. I'm just using it as an example because I think it's a really good example to understand that job seeking is boring. Yeah, it's not that exciting. Interviewing is in itself a little bit taxing on the candidate, trying to be the very best version of you, doing assessments and all these types of things. It's a sort of necessary evil to get to the goal. Um, but job adverts are very boring. 
really boring. I'll show you some examples, some little tidbits later on of, of that. So try and add some humor to it. Try and add some personality, particularly, you know, not your personality, the personality of the organization. So, you know, if, if love holidays are quite a relaxed and sort of fun place to work, it's reflected in their adverts. And guess what they are? Um, now, the next one, similar type of concept, and you've got the actual, they've just got a picture of the hiring manager. And it says, if you have a strong writing background, an interest in marketing and a passion for travel, then I want you in my team. So what a great call to action. It starts to build an engagement with um, the candidate. You can see the line manager. And I think, I think that works really well. So you prob you're, if you're going to take something from this area of the talk, it probably won't be to copy this example, but it will be perhaps to sort of bring, think about where you can add a little bit of humor to your adverts, make them a little bit more engaging. You know, particularly if you're, if you're not, you know, depends on your business. I, I, I met a business um, a while back. I always use them as an example. Uh, and what they do is, um, is freeze um, egg cells and eggs and eggs, sorry, um, for fertility. It's not quite as easy for them to be so sort of fun. And their work is so very serious and so very important to their customers that they have to take a different approach. Um, which I totally respect and understand. Assuming your organization is a bit more relaxed and is, is not working in such a serious area, then you can probably have a more open and engaging approach. And I would generally encourage you to do that. A key thing I keep saying throughout the whole of this talk will be, it helps you to stand apart. Because go check out, go search for that role you're struggling with, go search the job boards, look at the other competing adverts. Most of them will just be very boring a variation of the job specification cut down into some sort of something that pretends to be an advert but never really speaks to the candidate so think about how you can really speak to the candidate and stand apart but when we get to standing apart i want to talk to you about all things being the same all adverts appearing the same so um, i shouldn't be showing the passion image yet i'm going to come to the, the total jobs image in a second quick synopsis from you may not know Core values of Fortune 100 companies, the 100 largest companies in the US, 55% will claim integrity as a core value, 49% claim customer satisfaction, and 40% claim teamwork. The point I'm making is the terms that organizations use to describe themselves are all very similar, okay? And um, carrying on that conversation, total jobs, this is a search I do every year, normally maybe even more than once a year. I put the word passion, into total jobs. I searched just for employer adverts, not the recruitment agency adverts. And you can see 48,000 adverts have the word passion or passionate in them. Yeah, it's one example, but it's an extreme example. And that's just saying 47% of employer adverts use the phrase passion or passionate. Okay. You can't use that phrase. Okay. It's just, it's a great phrase. Everyone would love, uh, if someone said to me, Adrian, I've got this person, he's really good. Uh, and he's really passionate about recruitment. I'm not, I'm all ears. I'm very interested in, in speaking to this candidate about a potential job here at Highfall. Um, of course you would. You'd want people that are passionate about your industry, passionate about what you're doing, passionate about digital marketing or whatever their particular area is. But everyone's using this phrase. So as a candidate, it just appears like Ugh, nothing. You know, just, I've, I've read that every other advert, literally every other advert has that on there. So don't use that phrase and think about the way you... Um, present yourself, think about the things that make you actually unique as an organization and, and present those things in that way. So yeah, you really need to um, think about that <laughs> a little bit. I mentioned that we've got this um, stuff around job advert copy. I'm literally just touching on a tiny bit of it. We run a whole webinar on it and we have a guide that we can share with you as well. So um, I, I'll probably be able to share that guide um, with Hannah and Hannah can probably send it on after this session if you want to read a bit more detail. But if you are interested, then you can come along and check out the webinar where we teach you how to build a job advert template that, that is far more impactful. But I haven't got time to fall down that wormhole because I've only got 30 minutes. Normally I do, uh, oh my God, we're on 25 minutes already. Normally I do a much uh, longer one. So let me just zip through uh, on a few things. I'm probably going too long. First up, we need to find evidence. And one of the reasons we need to find evidence is there's a clear established fact that the way employees present themselves is actually not the reality, okay? So that's the general rule. Hopefully the way you present yourself is reality. Otherwise you're just kidding yourself and candidates will join and then quickly leave. Um, but because that's a fact and certainly large organizations do it, then you're going to find that candidates start from a position of skepticism so how can you help them find the evidence they need 
to actually really drive home who you are for them to believe in it. First up, I recommend video. So I mentioned photos earlier. I think videos are even more powerful. You can hear me talking today and you probably get a much better um, assessment of what I care about, you know, what I'm passionate about, um, you know, in regards to recruitment, these things. If I wrote a blog post, it probably wouldn't come across as easy. So doing good videos of CEOs, founders, your peers, managers, I think that's really key. Uh, if you have the time and capacity to do it, it does, you know, can cost a bit of money and be a bit, bit of an effort to do. If you're looking for a workaround on it, one of the things that we did um, at Highfall is we did audio interviews. So we just did a normal Zoom interview and we just cut the audio, edited it and just put it on our website. And then whenever anyone comes to interview with that manager, there's a 10 minute interview of me interviewing them, asking them, you know, what they like to recruit, what's it like in their team, all those type of questions. It's a nice, friendly way to sort of introduce them to the manager. Um, obviously, I couldn't really talk about evidence without mentioning Glassdoor. You know, Glassdoor is really, you know, a very powerful tool. Some of you might view it as a pain in the backside, but if you put the effort in to get it right, and uh, you can do a lot with it, I'm going to pitch for webinars again here. We have two webinars on Glassdoor where we show you how to do this. So I suppose it's a good thing. I'm just sort of saying, look, if you need help, we're here. We do free webinars. Um, one of the things, I'll give you one little idea on that that some people don't realise is even if you've got a very middling rating at the moment, let's say 3.5, which is about the average for the UK, the way the algorithm works is the more recent reviews carry more weight. So one of those webinars looks at how to encourage more positive reviews so you can easily get a few more positive reviews mm -hmm. and that can easily boost your rating because that's the more recent ones but ultimately you know whilst there's a few tactics around Glassdoor it's just about being a better organization for the most part you, you can't completely cheat the system but I will show you a few little nifty tactics around it as well now one of the things we did some research on uh, just to show you because everyone feels like Oh, everyone's doing Glassdoor better than me. If I said rate yourself on Glassdoor at the moment, some of you might go, yeah, two out of 10, three out of 10. In reality, I'm going to show you now, you're, you're probably, you know, even if you're not doing much, you're probably not far off what the average is. So we looked at a thousand organizations on Glassdoor, all of which had less than a thousand staff. By the way, less than a thousand staff is actually the sort of area we do training for. And it's also uh, where our products and services generally fit. So um, yeah, so less than a thousand staff is our sort of customer base is what we want to focus on. So we found the organizations that had at least a four out of five rating. These are the good glass door pages. In the UK, 1,055 companies, 89% had not replied to a single review, okay? So although they're good at glass door, although they've got a good culture and they're getting good reviews on glass door, they still haven't engaged. And 96% had not replied to all reviews. So if you claim your Glassdoor page, reply to all your reviews, you're going to put yourself in the top 4% for the, for the way you engage with Glassdoor. The rest of it comes from some other tactics I can show you, and obviously the reflection of actually how good you are as an organization. But it does go to show you that this is something that so many people are not really trying that hard at. So it's not that hard perhaps to be a good Glassdoor uh, page. Um, and then you can obviously use it. You can see the example here, AXA, they're using it in their advert copy. Another example here, Awoka, they're using it on their website. There's a widget you can put on your website, it's super easy. And then when anyone comes to look at you, they'll see that. If any of you, um, your organizations already sell uh, a product or service, particularly B2C, you've probably got Trustpilot or something similar for your core service. Um, and that's what makes new customers comfortable to buy from you. Well, you can use Glassdoor in a very similar way. And guess what? You know what I'm gonna say? Very few people do this. So then these are all impactful things that are easy to do. So hopefully that'll be useful. And let me prove to you that very few people do this. Once again, 433 adverts on um, total jobs um, use the term Glassdoor. So that just goes 100,000 adverts are on there, 102,000 when I took the uh, research on this, only 433, so less than half a percent um, re reference Glassdoor. And that's not because there's not many Glassdoor good rate pages out there. Some people have a terrible page. Lots of people have a good page. Very few people actually use it as evidence to say and back up their claims and say, how many of those organizations are saying, hey, look, we're a great employer in their copy? In words, maybe not those exact words, we're passionate about this, we're a great employer. Very few back it up with any evidence. Okay, so key takeaways here, job seekers will give you a chance, but you need to help them find what they're looking for. Photos and videos are gonna be really key if you can step up to that level. And, you want to be providing evidence you're a good employer. 
Now, let me just skip through the last piece. Are these advantages you're going to have over Google? Um, I'm not going to go into the story of uh, David and Goliath. You know the story. There's a really interesting story from Malcolm Gladwell about how actually David was the, was the actual uh, massive, um, well, sorry, Goliath was the massive underdog. But I won't bore you with that. I'm going to skip through that. Let me show you some of the advantages that you have um, over smaller companies. Let me go back, uh, back a step there. So first one is transparency. So this is Leap Software. Uh, we do free employee engagement surveys. And when we um, give them their survey, we offer them the chance to publish it so they could showcase it. And anyone coming to their website for a career at Leap could go check out their recent employee engagement survey. We've done a similar thing now with our careers page. I encourage you to check out high for careers uk and big companies won't do this they simply won't do this very few companies will do it anyway but small companies are more inclined to do it and it's just being transparent we just say look here's the stats from our survey we don't cover all the questions because there's questions there like have you any advice for us on how we can improve and we, we take that one internally but the rest of the questions we publish so my manager or someone at work seems to care about me and you can see that largely yeah that's a positive there that most of our staff believe that so transparency, a huge superpower. Big companies do not have it, um, but you can see it. Anyone watching um, Succession on Sky, there's a crisis uh, in week three and they're, they're talking about doing an open, ask me anything sort of question and answer style with all their employees and they completely fabricate it because they don't like any of the questions coming and they get their own questions. So I'm not saying that happens all the time with big companies, but big companies are inherently not very comfortable with transparency. Yeah, hurts their share price, let's say. They can't control it. Authenticity, this is another, uh, another key one as well. You know, it's very hard for BP to say, hey, look, this is us. We are BP. There are half a million staff all over the globe. It's very hard to nail that down. But actually, if you're honest, Burgers, um, go to their website, check them out. Very, very authentic brand they have. And the more you can say, look, this is us. This is what we believe in. The more authentic you're going to be. Hopefully I'm not going too fast on this. I just saw the time and thought, wow, I need to catch up. This is our HSBC. This is actually one of my last points. This is our HSBC describe their diversity and inclusion. Okay. It's a long winded legalistic. This goes on the bottom of all of their job adverts. Yeah. It, may, it does not move an emotion with any candidate, I would suggest. And I've got no critique of what they're doing for diversity and inclusion. They're probably doing a big program like all big companies are now some of them are really achieving things and others are not i don't know which camp hsbc fall into but i would critique them for how they present it on their adverts it's it's written by a lawyer essentially yeah um, and this is what you find in big companies they'll write they'll do stuff like this because they want to tick a box and no one's going to shout at them for that but really it doesn't achieve the end, end goal so this is what you want to avoid do not just say, oh, my company is an equal opportunities employer, because that says, oh, by the way, my company doesn't break the law when it comes to hiring people. It's not exactly the most engaging thing ever. If you can only say that, don't say anything at all. And then you've got this example from Avedo. Avedo is one of the rare places where anyone from anywhere with any background or experience is free to come and do their very best work. Yeah. And then it sort of talks about all the things they do. Equality and diversity and inclusion are values that are critical to our success. Come and see for yourself once again lovely call to action at the end there um, but that's actually making a statement they're actually saying less than hsbc one does but actually you get more of a feeling about what they care about and what they are and so it's authentic yeah smaller organizations are always going to be more authentic in this area okay so wrapping up um when when you're a sub 1000 staff organization you're more likely to be able to embrace real transparency to be truly authentic and be easily able to tell your full employer story, okay? Now, the last point I'm gonna make, as I go five minutes over, is diversity and inclusion has been really uh, important in the last couple of years. We've seen them being our busiest webinars that we do, and we've built features into our recruitment software, you know, really focused around that because our customers have been, you know, demanding it, and we're almost playing catch up. And I think, I think that's a fair point. I think a large part of the, the world is playing catch up when it comes to this subject. You need to think about what's the next subject that our organization needs to get ahead of, not just for our customers and suppliers and everyone else, but candidates are going to start demanding it. And if I give you a chance to think about that now, what, what, what do you think it would be? I think if you're watching the news, you'd probably be right in thinking it's going to be your carbon footprint. 
So I think diversity and inclusion has been there and you, you need to be saying something about that in regards to where your organization is and, and particularly when it comes to recruiting. And I think also you're going to see carbon footprint as well being a key thing. We're, we're literally just addressing it. We've signed up with Ecology and we've got a digital forest and every tree in our digital forest, there's a real tree that Ecology and their partners are planting for us. And we're planting a real tree for every webinar registration. Hannah, you need to mention this to your friend, to your, your boss's uh, um, uh, toolkit, mention it to Bob and the team. Um, we have a target um, of next year of planting 10,000 trees, which I'm sure you can do the maths, is 10,000 webinar registrations. <laughs> so, and this will form part of us saying, look, we're carbon neutral, which should probably be carbon negative at that point. Um, and we'll present that to candidates and it'll be a really interesting approach. And um, probably getting ahead of that, cause uh, at the moment now big companies will have something but most SMEs won't necessarily be dealing with that issue and presenting it so it's quite an important thing to be start thinking about and that's 37 minutes in it is the end of my presentation <laughs> here's my contact details guys so feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn um, and I'm a very approachable person my job title is actually chief helper co-founder slash chief helper so my email address is there so if you've got an advert copy you're writing you're struggling with you've got a glass door page you're struggling with just drop me an email. It'll take me about 24 hours to get back to you. I would always come back to you. And I, I say that because very few people do drop me an email. If everyone dropped me an email, I'd have to stop saying it, obviously. But very few people do. So take advantage of that. There's a competitive advantage that you, you can definitely have. Um, but yeah, that's the presentation, Hannah. Sorry for running over, but I've got time for Q&A now. No, that's absolutely fine. My antennas went up as soon as you said ecology as well. It sounds like a great business, so I'll definitely pass it on to management. Yeah. Um, but fantastic. I think I can speak on behalf of everyone, Adrian, that that was a great webinar and I've wrote down tips and I'm sure many people um, on the webinar today um, have done the same. Um, so I've just got question time. We've got about 20 minutes, roughly. Um, a few questions have come in already. So if you do have any questions, please don't pop them in the chat. Please pop them in the Q&A box at the top of your screen. Um, the one question we've got, well, we've got a few questions so far. Um, the first one being, if I can just grab it, um, what evidence um, can you provide if you're too small to be on Glassdoor? Um, so I'd, I'd ask that person how small they are. Um, so if we, if they were sub 10 staff, then that might be, diff it might be difficult even to do a survey, you know, they're 10 staff. Okay. Yeah. Cause if you do an employee engagement survey, there's a, there's a safety in the anonymity of it. And the smaller you are, it's, you know, it's harder to say, um, you know, it's, it's easy to be sort of, um, well, to be seen, to know who said what, um, so I would go with evidence. I would go with um, the video stuff if that's easy to do. And I don't think video has to be, you know, professionally produced necessarily um, or, or go with the audio stuff. Um, but it, it is a challenge because I think the surveys are, are not possible. And then Glassdoor, well, I think Glassdoor is possible if you're eight, nine staff. If you can ask three or four of your staff, you know, you can ask all of your staff to write a review. Um, you will see the smaller companies have an advantage on Glassdoor. It's easier to have a nice, close-knit, family-type culture when you're, when you're below 10 staff. As you get bigger, it's harder. I mean, we hire people, and I've got to make a mental note to remember their name because <laughs> it's 53 staff, and it's like, right, the new person's called Sophie. Right, good. So, yeah, so I'm waffling a bit now, but I, I don't think Glassdoor's out of the picture. You can get, get, a few, get a few reviews on that, and at least you're building it for when you're 20, 25 staff, and you can really start using it. Um, but, yeah. Amazing, thank you. Um, we've got another question. Uh, if you do have any questions, please do make sure you put them in the Q&A box. Um, and this person said that we are finding candidates are using our job offers as a tool to get a better job, a better offer with, a cur with their current employer, which is frustrating. What could we be doing or saying to eradicate this? Yeah, I'd have two things I'd say on this. And then the first one um, is going to be the essence of my talk. And it's going to be a little bit flippant. So I don't want to be rude to um, this person, which is to say um, that person comes through your process. They get to experience you as, a, as, a, as an organization. Um, you need to get their level of excitement and engagement to a level where they just turn down their counter offer. And I would not, no one, um, some people might go out to market and think, I'm just not totally happy here. And if I get an offer, maybe I'll get a better offer. But I think they are in the market. I don't think anyone, 
is not in the market, but uses the whole process completely just to get a better offer. So I think they are in the market, therefore you just need to, you know, perhaps convince them. There's also loads of research done with people that take counter offers saying it doesn't work. So I would stay in contact, leave, have a happy ending to that initial event, and then stay in contact and keep in contact. You might find that they get more money, but the problems that, that, that really motivated them just carry on occurring. Oh, fantastic. That's really well answered. Thank you. Um, another question here saying, how important is remote uh, slash home working as a promoter after the pandemic and some pressures to get back to work? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge advantage. I mean, I said all the reasons why people are moving. I, I didn't even mention this one, but it's, it's, it's a huge one. And we've seen some technology companies use this, obviously, even before COVID, that were already remote. Um, we um, needed to recruit a really, um, really strong development team. We're recruiting it in Madrid. Um, and the reason being, it's just easier to recruit high quality talent and secure it there. Because we're not, in this case, if we were Facebook or something, it would be easier undoubtedly to recruit you know, the very top. We're talking, we're talking top 5% developers is really what our aim is. So by being able to go remote of a role, you do open up the market and there'll be plenty of people, depending on the role as well. I don't want to be rude about, you know, there might be a role that is likely to be more female orientated, like um, a HR manager. Or well, that'd be hard to do remote, but there'll be certain roles um, whereby you might think, actually, there's lots of, I would think like a recruitment consultant, like you could do that remotely. You know, very few recruitment consultants meet people uh, for the most part. So we could hire people that, you know, working mums who've now gone, um, or even working dads obviously as well, who've obviously only got part-time hours and we could move them into that. So sort of, if you can work out all the logistics and how to go to market, it's an, it's an opportunity. The challenge you have with the adverts is, when you go to the job board, it's not in one set location. Now, the job boards will charge you, um, but it can work very well um, for a nationwide advert. You can say this is remote. And then whatever someone searches, recruitment consultant, Dorset, Birmingham, Edinburgh, your role will still appear. So that can, that can work quite well. Um, but I, I've recruited for remote ourselves here on LinkedIn. And it's a, it's a lot of work because the search comes back and it's, wow, there's, there's, there's a thousand people to go through rather than the normal 12. Yeah, no, definitely. And I've seen as well with um, social media marketing at Right Child Toolkit and just on the jobs part of LinkedIn, it's an option that people can just filter all the jobs and the yeah. same with any other job site now, I presume. Yeah, um, so, so some, no, most, you'd think most job boards would have that sorted. LinkedIn has, most have. So um, it's quite, quite, quite as broad. They will fix it. It's not that hard to do, really. And, but another key point on that is to be really deliberate. A lot of companies are saying we're open to flexible and all this. Be really specific on what that means. So this role, we expect you in the office no more than one day a week and, and put it out there and people go, right, because it is frustrating for those candidates who sort of approach all these roles, have the first conversation and they're like, well, no, it's sort of remote, but we want you in, you know, three days, four days a week or something. It's like, well, that's not really remote. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and I believe the last uh, question, if anyone else does have any, please do um, ask them now, um, is as a small business grows, skills not previously required suddenly become necessary. How would you approach recruiting for a specialist role? Um, you will find um, some, I know you're a small business, you're probably not keen to use recruitment agencies. You will find some recruitment agencies can test candidates for you. Um, and you will find, I mean, so we've moved from being a recruitment um, agency to being a recruitment software company. So we've had to make that sort of bridge and hire talent. Now we did that with like strategic consultants who were able to vet people and go, this person is excellent. Um, so that would probably be, is finding someone that can do that. And obviously there's a big wide world of freelancers out there. So you may be able to go to places like Upwork as well. Um, and you may be able to engage someone who's an expert in that technology and say, look, I just want you to help out on, on our recruitment process. Um, and if you can't build a test to confirm it, you can maybe just hire a freelancer and you keep them on an ongoing basis, perhaps to help you with recruitment going forward. Um, and what, what we tend to do here, which is really key, I think as well, we tend to do context specific assessments. Um, we use a tool called classmarker.com, which is really cheap to use and really easy to use. So if anyone's coming in, if they're, even if they're just, their role is gonna be sending emails back and forth, 
there'll be a test there, but it'll be very context specific. It'll say, this person's inquired about webinars, and then the task will be, you have five minutes to go to our website, find out about the upcoming webinars, and make a nice professional reply back to them. So it means that whenever we're assessing candidates, we're actually taking parts of the job and reflecting it back. Uh, and it's obviously a lot fairer. Um, but we also identify quite quickly, you have the shortlist pre-assessment and it can be turned on its head post-assessment. So yeah. technical, you can, it can be a challenge, but you will find there are tools out there that can help you assess people technically. And maybe organizations with those tools can help evaluate your role and build you the test and find out the parts that you want built into it as well. Or maybe that's a freelancer. And because it's too late for us all to go back to university and all be coders, unfortunately. Maybe our kids will be, but it's too late for us. <laughs> well, certainly for me, Hannah, you're much younger. You've still got several <laughs> careers in front of you. Thank you. Um, no, that's fantastic. I don't think we have... Oh, oh, we just had one last final question. Sorry, last second. Um, someone has said, is there room to develop a, an up and down, up and down stream approach to those in training as well as an alum, alum, alumni. <laughs> alumni group. Um, thank you for those that have left, leaving the door open for them to return. Yeah, yeah. So, so the up and downstream approach, I haven't heard of um, to, for, for those in training. Uh, I'm not so familiar with that. Maybe you could explain that, but I'll deal with the alumni bit first. Um, obviously big organizations have a formal alumni group and you'll see alumni groups on LinkedIn. So absolutely. I think it's important to do those exit interviews and to get the exit interview done by someone at arm's length. So not their hiring manager and not the CEO founder. Um, could even be someone outside of the business completely. Um, so you understand why someone's moved on and what the reasons were and you've got that and then do try and have as many happy exits as possible and maintain contact. If your employer brand is out there, we, we have um, a social media page. It's, it relates to recruitment as well called Life at Hireful where we talk about and we show what we're doing here at Hirefall. So if you've got that, you've got your, you know, a nice website showing what's happening with careers and news and stuff around your business, past employees will still be engaged a bit. They'll know people who've worked at your business. They'll keep a track of it, particularly on social media. Um, so then when you do, you might have a very formal program of reaching out to them every six months, checking in or 12 months or whatever it is. But hopefully in between those reach outs, they're going to have, seen various items and got a little sense of what's happening in your organization seeing you grow uh, and maybe yeah there's a good time to come back so uh, definitely try and reach into that and they'll have other people you, it's good people to reach out to to say you know if it's not you is there anyone else that's you know in your network that you know that might be looking and it just plants the seed so uh, that can be useful oh fantastic that's really useful Brilliant. Thank you very much, Adrian. As, as I can see, there's no last minute questions. Um, but what I'll do is I'll put Adrian's LinkedIn in the chat. So if you do want to connect with him, um, his email, I think, is on your on LinkedIn as well. So if you it's do want to get Adrian at highfall.co.uk. It's simple. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so please do feel free to get in touch. Um, and fantastic. Uh, I have also put a link to our next webinar in um, the chat. I'll just repost that link now. Uh, excuse all the links. Um, but if you do want to attend that webinar, it's on the 17th of November and it's going to discuss long COVID and how employers can manage it um, effectively. Um, so on behalf of everyone today, Adrian, thank you so much for your webinar. I have definitely taken some tips um, and it's been really useful for many people on the call today. Thanks, Anna. As you can tell, I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. It's fantastic. Um, and yeah, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar. And Adrian, if you can pass me that guide, we'll be happily happy to uh, pass it on to the people that attended the webinar today. Great. I'll get you that now. All right. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Thank you.